Okay. Uh, so let me continue. Uh, see how much of the many many things I prepared I'll cover in the next hour. So my my tutorial is somewhat shorter because it's a short day at the institute. Uh, so we have another hour. I want to tell you now about the, this zigzag uh, graph product, which is a combinatorial way of constructing expanders. And that was uh, done about 10 years ago in a paper with uh, Rheingold and Vadan. So what's the idea? The idea is uh, to define a, a product of graphs. So you want to take two graphs, they'll be expanders. You want to multiply them somehow. So let me define this multiplication operation. And I want to note that the only thing that can be arbitrary graphs, but except for the important fact that the degree of the first, this is like the big graph, the degree of the first is the number of vertices of the small one. Okay? So here is a small one, for example. But when you have this relation, then it's very natural to just arrange them like this. Uh, just uh, you put a copy of the small graph around every vertex of the big graph. This is a very natural thing that you would do. And so the vertices of the product will be just pairs, V, K, V in G, and K in H. And now the edges of the graph, here I just drew the edges of the copies and the edges of G, but now the way you connect edges in the zigzag is by a zigzag operation, which is, you know, you make one step in the cloud, you know, say, say you were here, how would you connect this vertex? You make a small step in, a, in the same cloud that this vertex is in, then you deterministically switch to the neighboring cloud, there's only one blue edge touching every vertex, and then you make another step in a cloud, in this neighboring cloud. So that's the zigzag shape. And that's, that's the edges, these red edges are the edges that will compose the graph G zigzag product H. And it's a very simple, you know, construction, and uh, what's pretty amazing is uh, you know, what it gives you, namely that if the two graphs are expanders, then the new one is also. So the new one will have n times n vertices. The degree will be d squared because there are d choices for the first step and d choices for the second. And if we had bounds alpha and beta respectively on lambda of g and h, then we get a bound alpha plus beta here. In fact, there's a better expression. That's just a simple expression. So if both are small, this is less than one, and we get an expander. So G zigzag H is an expander, in fact, if and only if both of them are. And the really remarkable thing that happens here is that there is the degree of the zigzag product depends only on the degree of the small graph. So even if the degree of the big graph was big, you know, it, it shows no sign here. So it's a way to reduce the error, the uh, degree significantly of the big graph and remain expanding. So that's uh, the magic. And uh, what it leads to, which I'll show you immediately, is then this combinatorial construction of expanders. Uh, before I show you this, I want to uh, show you a sketch of the proof of this zigzag theorem. And I'll show you the, really the intuition. The proof is linear algebra which follows this intuition precisely. So uh, what I really like about this is that uh, these are expanders for which I understand why they are expanding. So let's see the proof of this. So for the proof of this, uh, I think it's useful to view uh, uh, expanders in formation theoretically Namely, there are graphs for which you, each time you make a, a step in a random walk, your probability distribution gets an injection, an energy boost of entropy. So let me make this just a little bit more formal. Here's a graph. And we have two probability distributions, one before we make a random step and one after. So here is the first distribution. And suppose we selected vertex from it at random. So V is a random vertex from P and take a random step, okay? This creates a new distribution, just like we saw before, a random walk, and it's a new distribution P prime. And a graph is an expander if no matter what these distributions are, as long as the first distribution does not, is not already uniform, there is room to grow entropy, then the entropy of you know, V prime, the new distribution, increases by a little bit, by some constant amount. 
you inject log d bits of entropy, that's a random neighbor, and you get it in the distribution. And entropy, I didn't define it here. Uh, it could, you could take, you know, whatever you like. Basic expansion is taking the zero entropy, which is log of the support of the distribution. That was our combinatorial uh, definition. You can take Shannon entropy, you can take L2 entropy, which is Rennie entropy. In fact, that's what you need to take if you prove it in, you know, the linear algebra proof. But just think of it, you know, just uh, intuitively as entropy. So let me show why. So that's in, in, in any graph G. Why when we do zigzag, we preserve this property? And where is the zig and where is the zag in this game? So here's the construction again. And let's look at this zigzag. So we start here at some vertex VA, we take a random walk, let's call it VB, and then we move to the other cloud, then that's U, and with some neighbor C, and finally we end up here. That's one edge, right? So, uh, and we take this walk randomly. So what happens from the entropy viewpoint? Well, look, there are two cases. So what we want to prove is eventually that the entropy of this vertex we end up in <coughs> is bigger than the entropy of this guy. When this guy was sampled according to some distribution, which is not already full entropy. <laughs> so we want to prove that we end up with more entropy than we started, and there are two cases. The first case, which is sort of the easy case, is the case where when we look at the entropy of A conditioned on V, so we just look conditioned on V, what's the distribution in this cloud, it's not full. It's not full in this small graph less than log m, the size of this graph. Well, in this case, we are taking a random walk on an expander. H is an expander, so we should gain entropy. And, you know, so we gain entropy here, and it's just an observation that you don't lose entropy in the remaining steps. So you get with more entropy here than you started. So that's easy. So what's the problem? The problem is what happens if the entropy here is full? The entropy here, the conditional entropy is full. The first step doesn't do anything. It's uniform, it remains uniform. That's a waste in some sense. But it's not a waste because what you understand from the fact that it's, the entropy is full here is that because the total entropy is not full, then the entropy in V is less than log n, is less than the total entropy possible in G. So if you just look at the first coordinate, and you look at the first coordinate, remember that the pair has full entropy on A, so it's like a random step in G. So because of this, the entropy of U is bigger than the entropy of V. But what was this, this move? This was a permutation on the new graph. Only when we projected it in the first coordinate, we gained entropy. So it must be the case that when we look at the second coordinate, we lost entropy, it's a permutation. So that means that now the conditional entropy in this cloud on C is less than full. So what this generated, it didn't gain entropy overall, but it, the conditional entropy in C shrunk. It became, there is room to grow now in this cloud, and then the second step gains entropy. And that's the intuition. And of course, it's almost a proof. Uh, yeah, so. The problem is, uh, really, why is this, uh, you know, two cases, everything? I mean, I talked about one vertex. I should talk about all vertices, V. And are they mutually exclusive? Is it true that either, you know, you have full entropy in all of them or you have room to grow in all of them? And it turns out that, you know, when you move to the linear algebra setting of this, you, you really have vectors which you can partition into those vectors in which in every, co you know, which are orthogonal to uniform on every cloud and parallel to uniform on every cloud, and it just works. So they are mutually exclusive. And that's, that's the idea of the proof. It's as simple as that. So how does it uh, help us to build expanders? So why, that's again a very simple thing. We, again, we start with such, uh, uh, I'm, I'm restating the theorem again that uh, if we have bounds alpha and beta of the spectral parameter, then the new graph has low degree and is still an expander. So the construction, the iterative construction is as follows. We want an infinite sequence of bounded degree expanders. So we start with some, you know, constant size expander. It's an expander of degree d and number of vertices d to the fourth. 
and d is a constant. Now you may ask if expanders are hard to generate, how do I even get the starting point? Well, but first of all, since it's a constant, I can enumerate over all of them. But in fact, with these parameters, where the degree is polynomial in the size of the graph, there are simple explicit constructions. It's a variant on the projective plane. So the starting point is not a problem, but now you want an infinite sequence. So the first element in the sequence is just the square of this graph. And then the way you generate subsequent elements is you just do the following. GK plus 1, the next element, is you take the previous graph, GK, you square it, and then you zigzag it with this H. So it's a repetition of these two operations, squaring and zigzag. And the point, which I'll show you, is just that squaring increases the degree but improves the eigenvalue, zigzag, you know, decreases the degree and loses a bit in the eigenvalue, and you iterate them and you can continue forever. So here is the statement. GK for all K is a graph with this size, D to the 4K, so it grows, but the degree remains constant and the spectral bound remains constant. And you see it, you know, just by induction, you know, assume this for your graph GK, let's see why it's true for GK plus 1. When you square a graph, the number of vertices stays the same, the degree squares, so now we have D to the 4th, but the eigenvalue improved to a quarter from a half, and now we are in position to apply zigzag, which has D to the 4th vertices, right? So, and when we do that, well, we grow the number of vertices, the degree shrinks to square of h, so it's d squared again, like we wanted, and the spectral bound is just the sum of quarter and quarter, which is half again, and that repeats. It's as simple as that. This definition, uh, this iteration, really just generates in polynomial time a polynomial size graph. If you want it to generate an exponential size graph, what you do is a simple trick, is uh, rather, before you square, you tensor the graph with itself, which, you know, Anyway, I won't explain it. It's a very simple uh, way to actually get the speed of growth to be uh, exponential and that you get its strongly explicit construction. So what are the consequences of this? It's a, you know, we had algebraic constructions. Why have other constructions? It turns out there are lots. There are so many, and there are, some of them are really new, and uh, we see more and more of them. Uh, they are, you know, it turns out to, to do much better job for vertex expansion, and I'll show you uh, just one of these results. Uh, this is very peculiar uh, thing that we were trying to get out of the algebra, and uh, <laughs> nevertheless, we couldn't really do it. It turns out that it has, this construction is very intimately connected to algebra, to semi-direct product in groups, uh, and in this paper, we explored it, and then with this connection, we were able to, uh, you know, uh, show expansion, prove expansion for groups that are very far from simple groups and for which there are no other tools. So I'll show you this. And uh, perhaps the most fantastic consequence of this is uh, this result, uh, SL equals L, which uh, Russell mentioned yesterday. I'll show you this. And very recently, so I mentioned Manor Mendel, the super expanders, their construction uses zigzag, and uh, monotone expanders, maybe I'll get to it at the end. Okay, so let me first show the most spectacular, uh, you know, uh, application of all. This is about escaping from mazes. So what is this problem? It's, uh, you know, you know, it's both a very ancient problem and a very modern problem. You just find yourself somewhere. Uh, you don't know what the area looks like and you want to get somewhere. And uh, you don't have a map and you don't have the memory to draw a map. It's a vast terrain. So what you want is somehow by local operation getting to the place you like, out of the maze. So we are in an n vertex graph and we have only a local view. We can remember just, you know, the name of the place we are at, the information we see. <coughs> and Russell mentioned yesterday this fantastic result of uh, Aleliano, Scar, Lipton, Lovas, and Rakoff that says that if you are in an undirected graph, if there are no one-way streets, then random walk, you know, it's not an expander, but nevertheless, random walk is fantastic. You will, not, you, you will run it for polynomial time, not logarithmic time, but polynomial time, and you'll just get everywhere. A random walk will visit every vertex with very, very high probability. 
And the question since then was that of the randomization. Can one have a log space algorithm for connectivity, basically, for reachability uh, in such graphs, which is deterministic? And this was exactly what Rheingold proved. SL talks about just undirected connectivity in, in uh, graphs, and L is in log space. And he proved what he did is just found a deterministic version of this random work. It's a deterministic work that does as well in polynomial amount of time, visits every vertex in the connected component it starts in. So let me tell you the idea of this proof and how it relates to the zigzag construction. So here is the zigzag construction. I just showed you this. Well, Rheingold's uh, uh, construction is just the same. What he's saying is, you look at this construction of expanders. It does construct an infinite family of expanders. He says, well, let's not start from an expander. Let's start from any graph and do these iterations. And lo and behold, you'll get an expander. So you start from any graph, let's say, in fact, this lemma. So here's a zigzag theorem, but in, the, in our paper, we had a more general uh, result, which says the following. You just said to really notice it. Uh, if you start from any graph, and it has spectral gap epsilon, and you zigzag it with a good expander, then the spectral gap shrinks. The spectral gap grows. Sorry. So this should be 1 minus 2 epsilon. So this should be 1 minus 2 epsilon. Sorry about this. That spectral gap grows. So that's, so it, you know, it, you know, preserves expansion. But if the graph you start with is not an expansion, then it gets a better expansion. Expander. It reduces the degree, but it is this square. The gap, but not by, but still by the one. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Good. Yes. Sorry, yeah, you lose, sorry. Very good, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 the, I talked about the gap. Let me just, uh, yeah, so what's written is correct. So the degree, you know, uh, goes like before to this squared. And you get closer to one, but not too much. So you lose, I mean, zigzag loses in expansion, but not too much. And now you can just boost it back by squaring or by raising to a power like before, maybe a bigger power than two, and just repeat these operations. So you start with, uh, so your basic H will be like before some good basic expander. And you start with your graph, whatever it was, not necessarily an expander. And each time you, you create a sequence, you take your graph, you raise it to the fifth power because you want this epsilon over two to become two epsilon. And again, you zigzag with H to reduce the degree. You repeat it log n times, and you start with any connected graph. So let's say the gap, so this was, yeah. You have some, some bound which is polynomial in the size of the graph. In logarithmic number of steps, you'll double the gap from one until you get to a constant. And it will become an expander, and it will only be polynomial size bigger because each time you multiply it by a constant. And what's really crucial observation, and actually technically you have to work uh, a little bit to show that it's true, is that because both zigzag and squaring is a local operation, each one of these iterations can be performed in constant space. And because of this, and because you are doing a logarithmic number of iterations, in log space you can construct this graph. Once you have this graph, I mean, you don't really build it, you just... Uh, we have you to think that you build it, but you have an expander in an expander, the distance between every, we said, the diameter is logarithmic. So to test connectivity on an expander is trivial in log space. You just start from a vertex and try all parts of distance log n. You just walk and come back walk and in all possible ways, polynomial amount of uh, you know, time and just logarithmic space because the degree is a constant. So that's, that's it. So you just, Take any graph and transform it in logarithmic number of constant space steps into an expander. And that's the gist of it. So that was the uh, SL equals L. Now I want to move into this uh, algebraic connection. So like I said, zigzag, yeah, sorry. So SL is uh, 
is basically the class of all problems that are as hard as undirected connectivity in graphs. And L is the class of problems solvable in log space. It's called SL is symmetric log space. It doesn't take care of the one-way streets, and this is NL. Anyway, our way of uh, you know, doing PR for our subject is having unintelligible acronyms. Uh, so what's this connection uh, between the combinatorial construction and, uh, and algebra? So what's semi-direct product? Semi-direct product of groups is the following. Suppose you have two groups and one of them acts on the other as automorphism. So B is a subgroup of the automorphism group of A. And let's denote this action by, usually by an exponent. Then this this is the best I could do with PowerPoint for semi-direct product. Uh, so semi-direct product of groups, you just have uh, the elements of the new group are just pairs. And the group action is just like in a direct product, almost. So the right coordinate, the B part, you just multiply the two elements. But in the A part, you use uh, this action and add this so-called twist of uh, B on, I guess it's B prime at the action of B prime on A. Okay, so you have a twist. And that immediately creates, you know, a way from starting from abelian groups and build non-abelian groups, and uh, it's a basic operation group theory to build uh, small groups, uh, big groups from small ones. So what's the connection between this and semi-direct product? I think you may, maybe you see that it's somehow similar. Well, it's very similar. The connection is semi-direct product, it's a special case of zigzag product. And here is how you specialize it. Assume that you are in a Cayley graph where you have some uh, Cayley graph situation. So we have T are generators of the small group B, S are generators of the big group A, and S, the generators of A, are a single orbit under the action of B. So that's important. As you assume we have that. If we have this, then this connection is the following. So formalizing it is, is the following. The zigzag product of the two Cayley graphs, A with S and B with T, is the same as the Cayley graph of the semi-direct product where the generators are basically what happens in zigzag. Small step on, uh, you know, on the small graph, then using one generator, and again, a small step in a cloud. So, again, a zigzag for Cayley graphs with this condition is just zigzag product. And the proof is just, uh, you know, let me not do it. It's just an inspection. You have to just check and it, you know, it obviously works. But what it gives you is uh, some really interesting algebraic things. So one in the original paper with Alon and Lubotsky, uh, we proved that expansion is not a group property. I'll explain this in a second. And the other, it allows you to do iterative constructions of expanders for Cayley graphs. And you get very different expanding groups than what we are used to. So let me talk about this problem first. So we talk about expansion and expansion in Cayley graphs uh, a lot, but uh, Lubotsky and Weiss in a, in a really nice paper in 93 uh, asked this question of whether expansion for Cayley graph depends on the group or it just uh, depends on the generating set or it just uh, you know, how strong your group is. If it's strong, then it's, you know, it would be expand with any constant size generating set. So a group which doesn't, let's call it schizophrenic, it doesn't know whether it should be expanding or not. So, well, at the time, this is uh, many years ago, uh, you know, it seemed like it could be that uh, there are no schizophrenic groups because on the one hand, abelian groups, let's say cyclic groups, no finite generating set expand. And in groups like SL2P at the time, we didn't know it, but it seemed like no matter which uh, set of generators you take, the group is so strong it will expand with it. And in fact, this was recently proved for at least an infinite <coughs> family of P's. So this sort of suggests maybe there are no schizophrenic groups, but using uh, this zigzag product in Cayley graphs via the semi-direct product, what we showed is that uh, such groups that are not so natural are schizophrenic. This group, for example, the semi-direct product, 
is a, is a group where actually some generating set expands and another is very bad. Of course, that's not a natural example. A few years later, Kasabov you know, showed that the natural example, which people suspected, uh, is indeed, well, I guess it wasn't clear. People thought that maybe symmetric group is not expanding with any generators, but uh, Kasabov found a generating set, a constant side generating set for the symmetric group. So it's also schizophrenic. But anyway, the first proof of this was, used, uh, was using the zigzag product. Now let me talk about two examples of groups which are very far from simple groups and nevertheless are expanding or almost expanding with constant generating set. First, let me talk about near abelian groups. Uh, so just remind you, if G is a group, this is a commutator subgroup. And, uh, you know, and what are groups that are close to abelian uh, solvable groups? There are groups that if you take this chain of subgroups where the next group is just a commutator subgroup from the, as the previous one, well, you repeat it, you eventually get stuck. If you get stuck at one, and this takes k steps, then we call the group k step solvable. Okay, that's how far it is, how many iterations it is far from being a billion, basically. And Another result, so abelian groups are just one step solvable. You do it once and you get to the unit group. And another thing from the same paper of Lubotsky and Weiss is the lower bound of how many generators you need in order for a k-step solvable group to be abelian. We knew already before that for, that for abelian groups, you need logarithmic number of generators if you want it to be expanding. And what they showed is that for a k-step solvable group, what you need is log iterated k times of g as a lower bound for this. The proof is really beautiful, but you don't get a sense of whether you know, it's a technique that gives something or that's essential. You know, maybe there is a much better lower bound. And in this paper with uh, Roy Meshulam, what we did is uh, show that this actually is a tight bound. So we constructed solvable k-step solvable groups for which the generating, they are expanding with the generating set, which is as, uh, basically as big as the lower bound. So you can, that's actually, this bound is essentially tight. I'll say something about this construction. It's an iterative construction because it uses zigzag, and what it uses is this kind of iteration. You repeat the following thing. You have a group which is expanding. You take its semi-direct product with its group algebra. So there's a natural action there, and you can do it. And when you, when you start with any group you like, you just iterate this. And the nice thing is that the sizes of these groups grow exponentially every time, but the size of the generating sets, because we are doing zigzag, grows polynomially, and that's the source of the relationship between the size of the generating set and the group size, this log, iterated log behavior. And uh, I just want to mention that you know, this uh, playing with expansion in other groups brings, us, brings up connection between expansion, this notion, and really interesting parameters of, uh, of groups. In this case, it has to do with the irreducible representations of a group, which I want to take an opportunity to advertise this conjecture, uh, even though it may be uh, unclear to some. If we have an expanding group with a constant size generating set, then for every dimension d, the group has at most exponential, single exponential in d, irreducible complex representations of dimension d. Uh, so it didn't, doesn't matter if you didn't follow this. I just explained this theorem conjecture here. This is essential for the proof. So in the paper, we just prove it. It's a theorem for the kind of groups that arise in the construction. But I believe it's true for any. But anyway, that's an interesting connection. We'll see another in a second. So that's one uh, such non-simple group which expands with almost constant size generating set. Another very different type of group. <coughs> the spectral gap is bounded is 0.9. Yeah, the same. The random walk matrix, the spectral gap, it's not dependent on the degree. But yeah. Uh, Here's a very different construction. Here, the kind of groups that are expanding actually with constant size generating sets 
are automorphism of a, you know, a deregular tree of depth k. D is fixed and k is whatever you like, as, as deep as you like. And the theorem, uh, where is the theorem? That uh, this group, so here I have just an example, uh, expands with a constant size generating set. Uh, notice that, so it's also, again, the group is a group of all automorphisms of a tree. In fact, it's not all automorphisms, it's just the odd automorphisms. So at every vertex here, you have a permutation which is odd. Why odd? Because if you allowed even permutations, you'll have a, a big abelian quotient in your group, and that's bad. So that's a, a technicality. But anyway, this very uh, natural group, very far from a simple group, turns out to be expanding with a constant size generating set. And the proof is, you know, we use the fact that these kind of groups are actually, can also be built iteratively by a risk product. You keep, you know, adding a layer here is just doing a risk product with the alternating group. So, of constant size, so that's just like zigzag, that's a like semi-direct product. And uh, it's, it's quite complex, but I want to mention again, it comes, uh, uh, different aspects of uh, group theory come, come in here. In particular, I want to mention that this group turns out to be a perfect group, and the uh, solution of equations in perfect groups by, by Nikolov plays a very, very important role here. Uh, okay, so this was just to give you a sense of some algebraic things that can be done with uh, this zigzag product and the connection to semi-direct product. I want to go back to combinatorial expansion and show you that zigzag products and these constructions does better for combinatorial expansion than eigenvalue can give us. And I'll just give you one example of it, but then I'll give you an application. And this is for lossless expanders. This is in work with Capalbo, Reingold, and Vadan. So what's the most basic question about expansion? It's, uh, I didn't define it yet, but it's really the most basic. It's just vertex expansion. So you want a graph with n vertices, you know, the greedy, and we want every set S to have many neighbors. Many neighbors, let's say, C times the cardinality neighbors, you know, if there's room for it. And we want this C to be as large as possible. So until now, we talked about edge expansion and its connection to eigenvalue. You can talk about vertex expansion, this basic problem which is essential in applications. And what can this C be? Well, we have C is at most the degree. You cannot have grow by a factor more than the degree neighbor. That's trivial. Now you can ask yourself, what does eigenvalue give you? What bound on, D, on, on C it gives you? And, well, you'll take your best eigenvalue expanders, which are the Ramanujan graphs, and then do some calculations. If you do them uh, in an obvious way, you get d over 4, but Kahale did sophisticated calculations and got d over 2. And moreover, he showed that there are Ramanujan graphs for which this is tight. So you cannot get more than d over 2. So... You know, the most we can get is D. We can get D over 2 from Ramanujan graphs. When a computer scientist sees a constant factor gap, this problem is solved, and you move to the next problem. But somehow, for this problem, D, uh, this factor of 2 is absolutely, you know, beating it. It's absolutely crucial for lots of applications, so you can't move to the next problem. You do want to beat it, and you can beat it, because if you, you know, if you just consider a random graph, in a random graph, the number of neighbors will, will almost be the maximum. can be very close to this. In fact, it will be d minus 2. And what we can do is do this uh, using a variant of zigzag for explicitly in, uh, you know, ex do it explicitly in this paper. And this is zigzag on other objects that I'm not going to define. But the important thing for the applications is that this construction, this lossless expansion, is achieved for unbalanced bipartite graphs, the type I showed you in the beginning. Okay, and we'll see why it's essential. Uh, I mentioned that this beating this factor two matters, and there are at least five different applications where it matters. So you should believe me, it matters. But I'll show you one, one with error correcting codes. Okay, so anyway, the, let me. Uh, uh, is this analyzed with eigenvalues? No, 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 that's the point. And then you forget, realistically, 
that you get stuck. I mean, we don't know any existence proof of this. So let me tell you what we do know. First is that Vir and Spilka showed in a really beautiful paper that if you can construct these gadgets, you already have dimension expanders for any field. You just lose a constant in the degree. So that's a good motivation to construct monotone expanders. And they also show that you can construct them not with constant degree, but with uh, logarithmic degree. And then we started last year a little competition, this year, I guess, a little competition here uh, with Bourguin about improving this. And you can guess who won. Zev uh, Dvir uh, <laughs> and I got the degree down to any iterated logarithm. I mean, in fact, you're using zigzag. But Bourguin got it down to a constant. <laughs> Uh, let me, I'll say something about it. Uh, one, another feature of this uh, construction is just that if you had a magical way, an existence way, a random way to prove that this exists, it would immediately give a constant degree explicit construction, but we don't know how to do it except taking Bourguin's. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, that's a really nice open question. Uh, I don't think I'll tell you about uh, Bourguin's uh, expander. I have a slide about it, but I think we should, we should end. So, what? No, so just an existence. Well, here is why it's open. You should either go read Bourguin's draft and explain <laughs> it to me, or do your own existence proof. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really complicated. It's not fully written up. I don't know if it ever will be. Uh, but uh, a sketch is written in the, the French Academy, uh, uh, whatever, notes. So uh, I'm not sure Jean is going to write it up. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the end. It's exactly 12. Thank you very much. So let me ask you all, so there is no room for question because today is a short day. The institute staff has to disappear by 1 o'clock. So I ask you to go eat, and they ask me to ask you to clear the tables early so they can go to their institute picnic. Thanks.